Brett McKay here, and welcome to another episode of the Art of Manliness podcast. Now, if a man wants to get in shape physically, he'll often do what conventional wisdom tells him to do, and that's you know eat low-fat foods, count calories, and spend hours upon hours in the gym until his body is wiped out from fatigue. But what if, what if conventional wisdom was wrong? What if modern man's approach to health and fitness is actually making him less healthy? Well, our guest today argues that we should ignore the modern approach to health and fitness and take a lesson from, get this, cavemen. His name is Mark Sisson, and Mark does it all. He's a fitness coach, author, and he owns a sports nutrition company called Primal Nutrition. And his latest book is called The Primal Blueprint, Reprogram Your Genes for Effortless Weight Loss, Vibrant Health, and Boundless Energy. And Mark also writes daily at his blog about primal living at marksdailyapple.com. And he lives in beautiful Malibu, California with his family. Mark, welcome to the Art of Manliness podcast. Hey, it's my pleasure to be here, Brett. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. All right, so Mark, I have to say you make some pretty bold claims. You basically argue that what we've heard for years about health and fitness is wrong. And we should actually be taking cues from caveman. So what exactly is wrong with the modern approach to health and fitness? Well, you know, there's a lot wrong with it. And, and on the other hand... People will argue, look, I mean, there's guys at the gym who are getting buff and lean and they're, you know, they're getting results from doing all the work they're doing. Uh, so, you know, why would you argue with that? Well, my take on this is that I want to get as healthy and as lean and as fit and as productive and as happy, uh, and as functionally strong as I can on the least amount of work possible. And so there is an element of, I won't use the term laziness, but there is an element of efficiency to what I've chosen as the path to all of these uh, wonderful attributes that we are all seeking. I mean, Lord knows we don't have enough time to do all of the things that tend to distract us in this day and age, and there are tons of distractions. So my take on this is why should you waste your time uh, running endless miles on a treadmill to try and burn off uh, an extra few percentage uh, points of fat when I can point you to research that shows that that's not only not effective, it may be increasing the amount of body fat that you store. Uh, why would you want to, um, you know, cut back, diet down uh, on, uh, on your calories when I can show you historically through the record of the evolution of man over 2 million years that you don't need to cut calories as much as you need to alter the types of foods that you eat? I've been doing this for about 25 years. I started off as an as a elite marathoner and triathlete. I finished uh, fifth in the U.S. National Championships in the marathon in 1980. Mm-hmm. I finished fourth in the Ironman Triathlon in Hawaii in 1982. I was the consummate fit guy. Everybody in, in town knew me as the fit guy. But the problem was, as, as well as I could race and as fast as I could run and ride, um, I was not the picture of health. I was... I was at the effect of the kind of training I was doing. I had upper respiratory tract infections. I had irritable bowel syndrome. I had chronic tendonitis and osteoarthritis because I was doing it wrong, and I was going against what my genes, my human genes, expected of me in the way of maximizing my health, my strength, and my fitness. Modern health and fitness, I guess, takes things very specialized and very compartmentalized and what you argue with primal living, I guess, is a more holistic view? Yeah, very much so, and that's a good point. Um, I was a great marathon runner, but I couldn't play basketball. I couldn't move, move side to side because I, didn't, I hadn't developed those lateral uh, movement, those lateral muscles. Um, I had no core strength. I, again, I was very fit, and, and on a list of somebody's uh, attributes of fitness, certainly endurance is right up there, but I wasn't functionally strong. Um, I was fit, but I wasn't healthy. And, you know, what good is being fit if you can't race half the time because you're sick from catching the cold or from getting injured? So uh, one of the things that we note about the conventional wisdom, which would say, all right, if you want to be fit and healthy, you know, you want to get out there and do a lot of aerobic exercise. Well, the research that, that I've done for the last 25 years and, and about which uh, I started to write my book shows that, Yes, humans evolve to be very efficient, slow-moving fat burners. That is, we can walk really well. We can run occasionally. We can um, migrate, forage, uh, hunt, gather for hours on hours at a time and burn predominantly fat while we're doing this. Uh, 
But And we're also, by the way, pretty efficient, very, very fast sprinters for brief periods of time, 10 to 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. But we were never, we never really evolved to be the kind of runners that you would see, um, you know, at a marathon. We weren't, we didn't evolve to go out and, and run our heart rate up to 80% of its VO2 max for an hour or two or three hours at a time. And it turns out that that is counterproductive to building muscle. It's counterproductive to, to building good health. So, you know, I spent years as a marathoner, and then I realized I was tearing my body down and destroying my immune system. So when I went back and looked at the research, and I have a degree in biology, and I was a pre-med candidate, and I've, I've uh, been writing about uh, diet and exercise and nutrition for 25 years, so this is nothing that's, been, that's new to me. It's just when I put everything together, I realized, why don't we, wh- wh- you know, why do we assume that, as conventional wisdom says, that in order to be fit, we have to spend hours on a treadmill or on an elliptical trainer to get to get fit. Why do we assume that we have to go do, um, you know, these split routines multiple times a week on on these bizarre pieces of machinery that isolate certain muscle groups, but in fact um, set us back because they're not they're not using the compound movements that our genes expect us to do. Why are we eating a high complex carbohydrate diet when humans never evolved? To do that, and as a result, I came out with all of these these um, questions that I had of the conventional wisdom, and, and it turns out that we have been doing a lot of these things wrong for the last several decades, just under the assumption that because that's the way it's been done, you know, in the last fifty or sixty years, that must be the way we should be doing it. Mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of it, I guess, would have to do too with the way we approach science. We're very uh, very analytical, and so they'll. I'm guessing scientists said, oh, well, if you eat a low-fat diet, they saw some good results, but they didn't really look at the negative results of that. Well, one of the, one of the huge assumptions that conventional wisdom made a big mistake on was, was exactly that. Uh, you know, there, there are several books that have been written in the last couple of years, um, Good Calories, Bad Calories by Gary Taubes is probably the best one, which looks at the history of, of government recommendations about what we should eat and the whole uh, anti-fat uh, lipid hypothesis of heart disease, which suggests that, that saturated fat and cholesterol are the cause of heart disease. It turns out that they're not. They're not significant in, in coronary heart disease or atherosclerosis. But even though, even though studies for the last hundred years have pointed this out, a few key individuals in the science community who had their own biases convinced the policymakers that we should recommend that everyone eat a low-fat diet. And the next thing you know, that became the recommendation. Uh, anybody who wanted funding for a study on heart disease could only do it if they, if they were looking to prove that a high-fat diet caused heart disease. And the next thing you know, we've, we've got this um, conventional wisdom, this paradigm, and everybody is now afraid of fat, afraid of cholesterol, when in fact, there's nothing to be to be afraid about saturated fat or, or cholesterol, and it turns out that carbohydrate, a high carbohydrate diet, is really what's driving most of the problems that you see in heart disease, and certainly in our in diabetes, and probably in arthritis, and most likely in cancer. Hmm. So, one of the things that I talk about on my site all the time, and I I go into very heavily in my book, The Primal Blueprint, is how humans for two million years lived on a diet that was largely comprised of animal product, uh, you know, meats and fats, and nuts and berries and seeds and a few vegetables and fruits. But nowhere in our history, until a few thousand years ago, were there anything like grains or appreciable amounts of sugar. So humans evolved to, ex- our genes evolved to expect us to be eating a high fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate diet. And when we don't do that, when we eat the way we think we're supposed to by eating complex carbohydrates and whole grains and 6 to 11 servings of, of grains a day, when we eat according to the conventional wisdom, we are setting ourselves up for uh, weight gain, in some cases obesity, certainly setting ourselves up for metabolic syndrome and possibly type 2 diabetes, setting ourselves up for increased inflammation, which may manifest itself in arthritis and may also manifest itself in heart disease and other cases. Uh, and, and the record is becoming more and more clear on this, that things like sugars and grain-based starchy foods uh, have no real place in human evolution. They just 
sort of entered the equation 10,000 years ago when, when our ancestors discovered agriculture and found a cheap and easy source of empty calories, you know, to keep people alive. So, okay, so we, we've kind of outlined what's wrong with the modern approach to health and fitness, but what are the basic tenets of primal living? How does primal living counteract that? So primal living counteracts it because the assumption that I make is that we have mismanaged our genes. We have, our genes want us to be healthy. They want us to be fit. They want us to be lean. They want us to live a long time and be, and be happy. And all the things that we think we'd like to see in our future, our genes already want us to do. But we have programmed them with the wrong signals. And, and one of the things you have to understand is that the human body is, is changing and rebuilding and repairing itself on a minute-by-minute basis every single day and it's and it's your genes that are causing proteins to be made and enzymes to be made and and cells to switch on or off so if you can understand that genes didn't stop working the day you were born genes didn't stop working that you know that and only gave you blue eyes or brown eyes or or blonde or dark hair or fair skin or 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 sort of determine your height but genes are these little on off switches that that are always working on your behalf. And sometimes the signals you send them are turning on genes that cause inflammation. Other times the signals you send them are, cause, are turning on the genes that cause your body to, to want to become diabetic, to save you from the sugar that you're eating. So when you realize that we have mismanaged our genes, but you also realize that there are certain keys, clues to be found in, in our evolution that would show us how we can reprogram our genes to do the things that we want them to do to, to allow us to be healthy. That's really what the primal blueprint is about. It, it looks back at evolution and says, okay, you know, what did, what did our ancestors do for two million years that caused our genes to arrive at the exact point they were 10,000 years ago before agriculture, before civilization? And what can we do today to, to cause those genes to, to, to make us healthy? And it becomes a list of 10 simple behaviors, one of which is um, eat plants and animals. Well, that means eat meat, chicken, fish, eggs, nuts, seeds, berries. But it, it means avoid processed foods, trans fats, hydrogenated oils. It means avoid sugars. It means avoid um, uh, grains, which have not been in part of our diet for a while. It probably, for many people, means avoiding most dairy because dairy is only a few thousand years ago. If you limit your diet to eating plants and animals, as the first rule says, your genes will eventually reprogram themselves to, to make you an efficient fat-burning machine. You'll learn to, your body will literally learn to derive most of its energy from your stored body fat instead of depending on a regular constant supply of carbohydrate every three to four hours, like conventional wisdom tells us. I mean, don't you love the, the whole thing, the gym mantra, the guys in the gym who are trying to build muscle saying, oh, I can't go more than three hours without eating or else I'll lose mass. Yeah, I've always figured that was a thing invented by protein companies to sell more protein. But Well, you know, it certainly was promulgated by them and, and, and promoted by them, but, it, you know, it's just been the assumption that, mm -hmm. that, that humans are grazers and therefore we should graze all day long. Well, humans may have been grazers, but we always, you know, we went, we went days without any food for, for – hundreds of thousands of years of our existence, there were long periods of famine, and that's why the human body and our, and our, our basic genetic constitution developed a process whereby on those, in those particular times, we could take fat out of storage and burn it and live on it without any problems with blood sugar swings or mood or depression or anything affecting us. So that's, that's part one of the primal blueprint, eat plants and animals. Another one of the rules is move around a lot at a, at a low level of aerobic activity. So it, it, what it means is don't go out and, and um, lace up your shoes and try and keep your heart rate at a 75 to 85% rate for long periods of time, day in and day out. It doesn't mean you can't do it once in a while. Sure, it's fine if you want to go on a trail run and, and, and hit it hard for a day here and there. That's fine. But when it becomes this chronic, daily, repetitive sort of activity, what happens is it, it uh, tears muscle tissue down, so you can't really maintain uh, the kind of lean mass that you'd like to. Uh, it requires that you consume lots of carbohydrates day in and day out because when you train at that high level of, of cardiac output, uh, you're training 
too too fast and too long to be burning predominantly fats. So you have to get your your energy stores from carbohydrate, and that means you have to eat more carbohydrate than you burn off. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, so that's the reason. A lot of times you'll go to the gym, and you know, among elite runners, you don't see a lot of body fat, but among the the standard. Um, middle-aged, age group runner, you know, you go to the gym, and how many people have you seen at the gym every day or five days a week for the last three or four years on the treadmill reading those, you know, those <laughs> calories burned off, um, sweating their, uh, sweat pouring off their brow, and they still have 25 pounds to lose. Yeah, I see it all the time. You know, you see it all the time, and that's because it doesn't work. You cannot, the, the human body was not meant to be burning carbohydrate entirely and then go home and I mean the, the, the defense mechanism for the body is you get off the treadmill you burn 500 calories but your brain tells you to go home and eat 600 calories worth of carbohydrates to more than make up for it because your brain is thinking what if this crazy guy is going to do this again tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, so moving around a lot of at a, at a low level of aerobic activity means means hiking it means walking or it might mean jogging once in a while at at 70 percent of your heart rate or riding a bike easily if you want to do that on a daily basis mm -hmm. and every once in a while you can certainly go out there and crank crank off a you know a hard seven mile or something like that but it the the idea behind the low level activity is it is it promotes the the burning of fat and that's really what we want to do so it's about you know parking your car away far away from work as you can and walking it's about climbing stairs instead of taking escalators it's about standing up uh, when you're doing an interview on the uh, on the telephone and walking around the room every once in a while it's it's about moving around a lot at a low level of activity one of the other laws of the primal blueprint is um, sprint once in a while mm -hmm. and that's exactly what we we teach people once a week one of your workouts will be to to do 30 seconds to 45 seconds of a very all-out intense max heart rate sprint and it doesn't have to be on the you know, a running sprint. It could be on the bike. It could be on the elliptical. Whatever it takes to get your heart rate up into the into the max zone for just 30 seconds. Because it turns out that emulates what our ancestors did when they were in a, a fight or flight situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, eat to either kill something for dinner or to or to avoid being killed for something's dinner. We had to sprint once in a while, and the mechanism by which the body recovered is sort of that Nietzsche. Um, you know, uh, old old line that that which doesn't kill me makes me stronger. If you survive the sprint like that because it was a life or death situation, your body produced human growth hormone, testosterone, and it built itself back even stronger so that you could withstand uh, that same stress a little bit better the next time. So we tell people sprint once in a while, just once a week. You know, not and it's maybe six to eight uh, of these. 30 to 45 second bouts with a two minute rest in between, but in in 30 minutes you'll have accomplished more than you would with a a one hour um, jog on a treadmill at at 80 percent of your VO2 max. Hmm. And you know, Mark, this this all sounds great, but one of the criticisms I guess I've heard of the you know the primal living or the paleo lifestyle is that it, it tends to romanticize the life of a caveman. I mean, th these people argue, well, you know, didn't cavemen live short? hard lives so I mean why should we emulate them you know how would you respond to that type of criticism well I mean that's a common a common line and the assumption is that um, that they died the, I, I think the lifespan of uh, the paleolithic the typical paleolithic person about 10,000 years ago was probably 33 years mm -hmm. um, but you have to understand that that's an average lifespan and that includes death during childbirth uh, death from uh, traumatic uh, infection death from uh, you know, being killed by a by a beast or falling off a cliff, uh, and when you when you realize that that when you when you look at any hunter gatherer from modern times and going all the way back, and, and the, the science is pretty pretty solid on this, um, and you examine the skeletal structure, you you find 65, 70, 80 year old people who were very robust, uh, very healthy at the time of their death, uh, who um, you know, could could um, withstand stresses far greater than we could today. So they were generally healthier, uh, stronger, leaner. Um, we don't know if they were, you know, happier or more productive, but we can we can assume that uh, that they they probably were. 
so the the average, in fact, there have been some scientists who have done some extrapolation and suggest that that the maximum possible lifespan of those ancestors that you talk about was probably 92 or 93 years old. So wow. they could have lived that long if they'd avoided, you know, the massive all of the stuff that that we take for granted now. You know, like, the, the, like getting eaten by a, a saber toothed tiger or something. Bingo. Like that. I mean, you know, or to put it another way, um, I'm 56. Two years ago, um, I injured my knee in an ultimate frisbee um, in a stupid catch, if I have to <laughs> tell the truth. Um, had I not gotten surgery on that knee, and had this been 10,000 years ago, you know, I would no longer be able to run away from danger. So I was probably dead meat at the age of having survived quite nicely to the age of, of 54. Um, you know, I, I probably wouldn't have been long for the world because of that trauma. So it's, it was all of this, this collection of all these possible ways of dying traumatic death that lowered the average lifespan, but certainly did not alter the maximum possible lifespan. And, and yet, as we say today, and we find in hunter-gatherer societies today, you know, a 70-year-old or a 75-year-old hunter-gatherer can still scamper up a tree and, and catch food and can still, you know, uh, have all the sex he wants and can still do all of the things that a, that a 25-year-old can versus looking at our society today where a 75-year-old man is, the typical 75-year-old man is, you know, um, a far cry from that sort of robust health. Hmm. Uh, all of which goes to, to just sort of point out that when, you, when we talk about emulating our, uh, our hunter-gatherer ancestors, we're just looking at ways to maximize the best possible gene expression. Uh, and when we get around to diet, uh, you know, one of the one of the things that we talk about as one of the rules is avoid poisonous things. That was one of the things that kept our ancestors alive. I mean, if you, they had a very keen, acute uh, sense of, of smell and taste. Um, we certainly have the the means with uh, with our ability to literally um, to vomit if we eat something that's bad, or our kidneys or our liver can filter out certain poisons. So you know we have that going for us, but um, and that's what our ancestors relied on. But that, but today we have all these other poisonous things that we still need to avoid: sodas, um, you know, uh, hydrogenated oils, um, processed food with chemical names that you can't pronounce and that have uh, long-term potential consequences for ingesting them. Those are the sorts of things that we want to avoid, and that's why we 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 say that it's, it, it really is imperative to kind of emulate what our ancestors ate. And that means if it typically, if it has, if it has a nutrition fact label on it, it probably isn't worth eating. <laughs> and going back to that, you know, you know, you say eat meats and veggies um, and avoid grains, but how do you do it practically? A lot of the, our readers are younger men. They're in college. So they don't have a lot of disposable income. It just seems eating just veggies and meat, I mean, that can get expensive when the cheaper alternative is go to the, the supermarket shelf and get whatever has grains in it. You know, everything these days seems to have wheat or corn and it's cheaper than the healthier option. You know, how can you make the primal living lifestyle affordable? We have a lot of uh, my readers at March Daily Apple who um, make a science of going to the butcher and getting end cuts and getting organ meats uh, and getting the cheaper cuts of meat that are that, that, that don't sell as well because they are fattier. When in fact, here I am suggesting that the fattiest cut of meat is the best cut of meat you can get. Mm. Uh, we have um, people who are have converted themselves into what we call modern foragers, and who are, uh, you know, buying the value pack of uh, the chicken legs, and and instead of buying the skinless chicken breasts, which are twice as much as the ones with skin, they get the the full on chicken breast with the skin because A, it's better for you, B, it's cheaper, and C, it tastes better. Mm-hmm. Uh, when when you kind of cut to the chase on all of these things and do a little, just a little bit of homework, you realize that we waste a lot of money on processed foods that are actually um, n- not only not good for us, but aren't as inexpensive as we think they might be. Uh, the first thing people notice about switching to a primal uh, type diet, when they cut the carbs, they realize that they, they're not as hungry as they once were because carbs, carbohydrates do drive hunger. They drive appetite. They, they drive up insulin, and insulin is involved in, in um, you know, storing fat and basically storing everything as fat. When you 
reduce the amount of insulin you secrete because you've reduced the amount of carbohydrate. You don't store as much. You take more fat out of storage and burn it on a regular basis. And, and as a result, you don't need as many calories to get through the day with, with full energy as you did when you were a carbohydrate consuming beast. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the end result of that is it doesn't, it doesn't take as, as many calories, as many, um, you know, if you're doing a cost per calorie analysis, it doesn't take as many calories to keep you going. And there are all sorts of uh, options. People look at uh, how much they spend on diet soda, thinking that they can't live without diet soda, but thinking that they're doing themselves a huge favor because they're not drinking real soda. Mm -hmm. Well, diet soda is just as bad or worse than real soda. If you can wean yourself off diet soda, and, and get a simple filter for your tap uh, and drink regular water instead of diet soda. And by the way, they both have zero calories. Uh, you know, you might save yourself 15 bucks a week just, just doing that. There are all these little areas that we can look at and go, wow, I just didn't realize how much I spent on my, you know, my Starbucks latte or my, or my mid-morning uh, cola from the vending machine or, you know, whatever else, my snacks. And it, it, I mean, I've got people living on three or four bucks a day and eating yeah. a lot of meat and, and, you know, getting their produce from a, from a farmer's market or trading it for something else. It's, it's, it's part of the fun of living primally is figuring out ways that you can, that you can, um, you know, do this on a budget and be healthier than the guy next door. Yeah. And it also looks like there's, you know, some hidden ways you save money. I mean, according to you, if you live the primal diet, you're getting sick less often. So that's, Unless you have to spend on medicine, on doctor care, on... Whatever. By the way, that's huge. Yeah. That's huge. I mean, I tell people, you know, if you start going primal now and you don't get uh, type 2 diabetes as a result of it and you don't develop in your 50s or 60s some kind of heart condition or you don't develop some form of, you know, God forbid, some form of cancer, you, you could be looking at that as a better investment than a 401k is. Yeah. I mean especially today, <laughs> but, you know, you can say that, that and I, it's a cliche, you know, you invest in your health, and when you have your health, you have everything, but, you know, ask some 75-year-old who's just getting out of the hospital having had a, a you know, a, a quadruple bypass and has a $250,000 bill to face, uh, you know, what he'd rather be, be facing, um, a little bit of a change in a lifestyle 20 years earlier, or, you know, the bills and, and the, all of the heartache and sadness that comes with and the loss of function and, the, and everything else that's, that comes with not having taken care of yourself. The, the thing about the primal lifestyle, it's, it's, so, it's, so, it's so easy to incorporate and then to, and then to realize that you can live this way for the rest of your life. It's not like it's a 60-day diet or a 30-day um, you know, regimen or a two-week cleanse that you're going to do and then it's gonna, you're going to go back to the way it was. Most people who adopt this style of eating and exercising and sleeping and otherwise living, uh, the, the biggest testimonials I get are from the people who go, look, I not only have a weight lifted from my gut, I have a weight lifted from my shoulders because I, I can see clearly that I can live this way for the rest of my life and, and not only not get sick or not only not worry about getting some disease, but literally for the next couple of decades, I can improve my strength, I can improve my endurance, I can improve my, my mood. I mean, it's really exciting for a lot of people. Yeah. And, Mark, it sounds like the primal lifestyle is going to be a big change for a lot of people. You know, you're, they're used to eating, you know, carbohydrate-based diet. They exercise on the treadmill, you know, every day for 30 minutes. And for a lot of people, this, this could be a big lifestyle change. So what is your advice? Should people make the changes all at once or should they do it little by little? Well, I think people <clears> – <throat> Historically, we've been doing this for three years now on a site, and we get a lot of feedback. Thousands of people have, have taken this program on. And I guess I guess we only hear from the ones who, who are successful. We don't hear from any who have set up, I tried it, didn't work, I'm out of here. Uh, so there's a little bit of a filter going on there. Maybe there aren't any, I don't know. But um, for the most part, the, the way they do it is they usually start with a diet, and it usually starts with cutting sugars and grains. And they begin to feel better, and they realize, wow, I've, you know, I, I just cut, all I did was cut sugars and grains. Um, Mark said I could eat all of the lamb chops and pork chops and fish and salads and eggs and meat and nuts and you know all this other stuff that I want. But 
turns out I don't even really want to eat that much because once I cut the carbs, you know, my, my, my appetite went to a realistic appetite that was all I needed to, to maintain. They report that they'll lose a couple of pounds a week steadily for weeks at a time or months at a time, depending on how much they need to lose. And then they go, whoa, if the, if the diet is working, I'm going to try the, the exercise regimen. And the exercise regimen is it's actually simpler than what they're used to because they're, if they're used to working out six or ten hours a week, now they're, now they're working out three or four hours a week total, and they're still getting stronger and they're still burning the fat, and they can see their abs, so they're getting, you know, they're getting the whole washboard thing going. And one of the things that I, one of my ten laws is play, and I'm really, I'm really adamant about that. We don't play enough. It has uh, stress relieving qualities. It has, it has qualities uh, that um, that incorporate a lot of the of the strength that you build in your workouts. Now you can use it when you play. So pick up a new sport, uh, and so a lot of people find that they're they're able to get out and play with their kids, or they're or they're playing with their uh, their college buddies, or they're you know they're they're playing touch football or soccer or ultimate frisbee or whatever it is. They're able to do something that they couldn't do uh, a few months ago because they they might have injured themselves. But now because they're learning how to uh, spend more time working on their core, or they're learning how to actually train their feet in the, in the uh, mode of barefoot uh, training, which is one of the new offshoots of the primal program. They're not getting the muscle pulls anymore, and their their speed is picked up. Uh, and it it and it sort of snowballs, right? It, it, it turns mm-hmm. into this this thing where the more they take the lifestyle on, and the more they realize that it's easy to do, that there's zero sacrifice involved. If anything, they're doing, you know, they're they're eating better than they were when they were, and and they're enjoying their food more when they were on their conventional wisdom diet. That they're working out. Um, they're spending less time working out. Yeah, they've got they've got a couple of workouts that are ball busters here and there, but that are that are actually you know doing the the building phase. But it doesn't take that much because once you cut the carbs, you don't need to burn the fat off. Your body's already burning in a in a fat burning mode, whether or not you exercise. So exercise just becomes then a a you know a a, a functional strength building routine, which doesn't take very much time at all. The next thing you know, they're looking into their sleep, and they go, wow, I, I realize now that I, I, I hadn't been catching up on my sleep and how important sleep is. They're getting more sunlight because they realize that, that this whole conventional wisdom advice to stay out of the sun mm-hmm. is antithetical to health, that one of the biggest uh, factors in the increase in cancer in this country isn't because we've spent so much time in the sun. It's because, ironically, we haven't spent enough time in the sun. Hmm. And it's time in the sun that causes the body to make vitamin D. And vitamin D is one of the most important elements in our immune system, and particularly that part of the immune system that kicks cancer out. Uh, and, it's, and it snowballs, and it becomes a great lifestyle. And as a result, people wind up going onto my forums and my comment boards, and they, now they're now they're they're doing these um, primal meetups in different parts of the country where they'll they'll get together and they'll have a barbecue and they'll exchange ideas for new primal recipes and they'll play uh, you know some kind of a uh, you know obviously between you and me we know we know ultimate frisbee is the best game on the planet so of course, they'll, of they'll play some ultimate <laughs> you know but but it's it's really it, it is a it, it's this kind of a lifestyle that's easy to undertake to embrace. And then certainly to support with other with other people. Wow. Well, this was a, a lot of great information today, Mark. Uh, thank you again for speaking with us today. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure, indeed. Our guest today was Mark Sisson. Mark is the author of the book Primal Blueprint, and you can order Mark's book at primalblueprint.com. And make sure to check out Mark's blog, marksdailyapple.com, for more information about primal living. Well, that wraps up this edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. And before we leave... I want to make a plug for our book. Yesterday was the official launch of the Art of Manliness book, and thanks to you all, it was a big, big success. Thank you to everyone who went out and bought a book. Thank you to everyone who helped spread the word about the Art of Manliness book. We really, really appreciate it. And if you haven't ordered a book yet, we really encourage you to go out and do it this week because we got a great deal going on. If you order a book before October 12th from Amazon.com, from BarnesandNoble.com, and you forward us the email receipt you get, we will email you a link to download a free copy of our man's guide to the holidays. It's a cool ebook we put together to help make your holidays manlier filled with tips like how to cut down a Christmas tree or how to start a roaring fireplace fire. So do that before October 12th and we'll get you a copy of that free ebook. 
And that's it. We really appreciate it. And until next week, stay manly. Stay manly.